I don't have, I feel like I don't have enough time. So I'm real, I'm real stingy with my time. But I found that, you know, I used to go through my files in my computer and say, oh, I'll print this one tomorrow. I don't wait till tomorrow anymore. I print it right then and get it on the desktop. So I'll, otherwise I forget. I got such debased all over the place. It's what's weird, what's weird is the, con you know, you, you, as you get older, you realize how, how much of this stuff is consequential about anything. Yeah, tens of thousands, I'm sure. It's probably more than that. I started shooting in 19, or 1964 or 5. It's my second year of college. I was shooting before that, actually. Well, black and white film is gorgeous, you know, and, and it was affordable, and it was, the, it was the medium of the time. There was no affordable way to make color prints back then. Yeah, I do both, yeah, because, you know, I, you know, there's 100 feet of film right here, and that's 17 rolls, and I'll go through four rolls a day real easy. Most of the time when I shoot digital, I throw the color out because I can't get it right. Even with Photoshop, it looks funny. And it doesn't, the light in digital, I've never, it, it's, it's not there. It's a different sort of look. You know, the color isn't anywhere what we're seeing anyway. It's just arbitrary. It's just sort of, it's like color TV. It's like, that's not real. The color in films, while I was out there, was nowhere close to what I was looking at. So, you know, it doesn't, you know, and everyone sees different. Everyone sees different kinds. Most people, a lot of people don't even understand light and shadow. Well, I used to come here as a kid. I was like 12 or 13. We'd go through Roslyn and we'd go up to the end of the road, put on our packs and take our fishing rods and go up to these ridgetop lakes and go fishing. And I, it was like Disneyland, except it was better because it was real. These big granite slabs around these lakes and fish swimming around and lightning storms where at night where everything turns blue and it's interesting this drama happening in front of you and it just it chooses me I don't choose it you just see it and and I know a lot of photographers say, oh, I can't photograph anymore. And I say, just don't worry about it. It'll find you. And it's like fly fishing. You just keep casting and casting. I, you know, I find, you know, when I see a fish jump, you go after it. Well, yeah, it's like going to a movie, sitting in the front row. You know, you see all that stuff happening. You see something like this big in a magazine, you don't see any, it's, it's just, there's no point in it, at least with my stuff. My stuff needs to be, you know, at least this big. I used to make 40, 40, 30 by 40 inch prints. And the largest picture I made is about 88 feet long. And so that's the one on the side of the, of the uh, county building. And there's two on the north side that are about, one's 56 feet long. And the other is 20 by 27 feet. I've got everything on that, on the county building. It's, there's two clear cuts and one abandoned landscape. The one on the south side is the infield of the, um, the Long Acres racetrack when it was long abandoned. And then when I was a sophomore in college, we were, had an apartment. Uh, over across from Dunn Lumber Company there in Seattle. And um, that winter, a guy knocked on the door and it was an old friend that graduated the year before. And he was headed, he came back to Seattle, I don't know what for, but he was an amateur photographer. And he, he had a, uh, he had his, his an old Minolta autocord and a film developing tank. And he l moved on to our couch for the, for the, all winter. He was there all till through spring. I just started walking around with this camera taking pictures of the neighborhood and I never stopped. It just, it, it, it grabbed me. I, I, I kept, I was studying painting 
I got a degree in, in abstract expressionism. It, took, it was a five-year program, and they all, the teachers all said, oh, photography is just all bullshit. And I said, yeah, but that's the way. I'm doing it anyway. It showed me how to, it showed me how to look at the world. You know, you start, you take a drawing class, you got to look at stuff. There's this, there's over there. When most people, you know, they don't, some of these schools don't study, they don't offer drawing anymore. Drawing is a way to find out what's out there, because what you see, most people, how you perceive the world, when you draw it, you see it different. When you photograph it, you see it a different way. There's all kinds of ways of, of uh, absorbing what's out there. And what I find is quite often people that haven't been through an art school or, or studied art history, they they need, they need to start. I, I, I'm, a, I'm convinced most people don't see those photographs I have on the walls on the side of the building. They don't know they're clear cuts. They can't tell because they don't. There's no registration. There's no. That's my theory. That's my tin hat theory. <laughs> I wear a tin hat 24 seven. <laughs> Yes. Oh, absolutely. You can't you can't trust uh, the art world to for validation. Yeah, this is the United States, and everything's commodified. So if you can commodify your work and sell a lot of it there, good for you. But that that doesn't mean it's any good. Yeah, I got that from my old high school vice principal. George Bissell and this photographer Don Normark told me the same thing a couple of years later. I ran into, ran into George in the bank one day. I was just started college and I said, George, what do I, you know, what am I going to do? I'm just a young, dumb, dumb, dumbbell. And he said, oh, just do whatever you feel like doing and to hell with everything else. Don't listen to anybody. Humor is the only way you can figure out the universe. You take it too seriously, you get, you get in trouble. <laughs> I keep telling people my mentors were Groucho Marx and Bo Diddley, so. I think I'm grateful for all my friends. I've got, you know, really good friends everywhere. And they're, they, you know, they enrich your life. My friends and my dogs and cats. And I think I'm grateful that I'm feel good. My knees still work. I can breathe. I can get out in the woods. And I can, um, what am I grateful for? Oh, I got heat in my house and running water. The hot water comes out of the tap. <laughs> I mean, talk about, we're living, we're living like kings compared to the rest of the world. And this is, this is, uh, I think, you know, when the third world is knocking on our door and we there's no way, you know, come on, we can feed the world and we're not doing it. What's the hold up? Yeah, well, in 1978, I bought a house in Seattle. So I had, I got a new phone number and it was 633-2255, 206 was the area code. Some guy out of the blue called me up and he said, did you know that your phone number spells oddball? He says, that's my old phone number. I thought you should know that. And so I've had it ever since 1978. So I'm at a meeting or something and I say, if you want to get hold of me, the easiest thing to do is call or text. It's 206 Oddball, you will never forget my phone number.